you know how sometimes you meet somebody and you just fall in love platonically or romantically. And sometimes it's because that person is so much like you. That whole idea of twin souls makes tons of sense. But other times you meet someone who is almost your polar opposite. Maybe they come from another part of the world. Maybe their educational and professional background is entirely different from yours. Maybe they use a vocabulary and a way of seeing life that isn't the one that you've been using. But when you meet them, you're in love. Well, that's what happened with me and one of the wonderful people who is going to be on this program today, along with a brand new friend. It doesn't get a lot better than that. Hi, everybody. I am Victoria Moran, host of the Main Street Vegan Podcast. Thank you so much for spending this time with us today. We have the whole luxurious hour to talk about a single topic with two amazing women whom I'll be introducing to you now. The first, Nivi Jaswal, actually is that person that I just knew, oh, we're going to be best, best friends, even though you have to translate for me a lot of the terms that you use that come from the corporate world and the business world that is not my background. She is Nivi Jaswal, and she has joined forces with Dr. Erin Sanave as co-investigators of Project Gaia, a public health research initiative, part of the Divinity Research Program. Dr. Sanave is a nurse practitioner with a focus on allergy and immunology. She's based in Chicago, and she is a co-lead of HEAL, a member interest group of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Nivi Jaswal is the founder of the Divinity Research Program, and she is based in Boston. She has a corporate marketing and brand management background with consumer packaged goods, life sciences, and media and research experience. Welcome, Nivi and Dr. Aaron. Thank you so much, Thank you. Victoria. Great what a here. pleasure. It's, it's so much fun to have you. And now, of course, we're recording these podcasts on Zoom, so you can also watch them if you like, if you want to see what people look like uh, on my uh, YouTube channel, Victoria Moran NYC. So I am seeing these two lovely women and their smiling faces, and maybe you'd like to do that as well. So let's just start out by getting acquainted. So uh, let's start with Erin, since my listeners and I will be getting acquainted with her for the first time. So tell us how you got from where you started to being a plant-based expert. Sure, sure. Thank you. Again, thank you for having me. It's an honor. I, I have admired you for many, many years. And so it's thrilling to be here. Um, but I am originally from uh, Nebraska, the middle of Nebraska, which is a farming community. Uh, growing up, we had uh, meals that consisted of meat and dairy, every single meal. And, and it's really the livelihood of the community. So it is un, unlikely that I would be where I am right now, right? So, um, but when I went to college, I dabbled in vegetarianism for a little bit. I just primarily because I thought it was healthier. Um, that said, I was not necessarily eating healthier. You know, I was having butter on my pasta, cheese pizza, you know, and, and, and that did not result in feeling better. So I kind of went back and forth for many years. And then I met my husband, um, Tim, Tim, who is also, a, you know, amazing person, but we were both in the military. And so we were bouncing around the country, you know, and um, anyway, we, we met and then we sat down and said, let's, let's watch a documentary. And we picked Hungry for Change. And that was like the moment we changed. We watched Hungry for Change. And then we quickly watched Forks Over Knives. And that really changed our life. We started reading the research and the books that really talked about the connection between what we eat and health. Um, we read things like Eat to Live by Dr. Joel Furman, The End of Heart Disease by Dr. Esselstyn, The China Study, all of those. And um, so then I went on and I, I, you know, I'm now a nurse practitioner. And of course, I've seen patients every single day struggling with chronic lifestyle diseases like diabetes and heart disease and all of these things that are really preventable. And so, um, as I switched and my family switched and, and, you know, to a whole food plant-based diet, I knew I just couldn't keep it to myself. So I, I have been on a mission ever since to help improve, uh, the health of my family and my friends, as well as my patients. 
Well, it's a wonderful thing. The stories of how, how we get here and the documentaries are so wonderful. It seems like more people make this change because of watching a documentary than just about anything else. Yep. The internet is yep. great. The books are great, but it just seems like we've got this wonderful um, body of work in, in film that makes right. so much of a difference. That's so, true. And, and you and I, Erin, come from just about the same part of the country because I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. Now, Nivy, you have a much more um, exotic background. <laughs> Tell us about your life. Well, thank you so much, Victoria, for, you know, uh, for your friendship. And, and it's an honor to be uh, on the Main Street Vegan podcast and now in the YouTube show Avatar. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, well, I come from the Midwest of uh, the Midwest equivalent of India. So the Midwest equivalent of India is the northwestern part of India. Uh, my home state is called Punjab, and it is, um, you know, fertile and it is, uh, you know, used for monocropping and, you know, for corporate agriculture and um, and there a really intimate links between the food systems and the technology of, uh, you know, how humans produce food um, between the states of Iowa, Illinois, Nebraska, you know, and, and Punjab. So, and I, I grew up um, as a, a child uh, of two anthropologists. So I had an opportunity to travel, you know, within India and around the world, um, including to the US um, at an early age. And um, I um, grew up, uh, you know, not being a vegetarian because a lot of people from my part of the world, um, you know, do eat meat and, and, you know, they love butter chicken. And in fact, my hometown is credited. It has a dubious distinction of being known as the home of butter chicken. And the, the name of the city is Ludhiana. And it's a it's almost like a 16 million people city. Um, anyway, so I grew up with an idea of protein being animal based protein being extremely important for human health. I switched to um, a ketogenic diet because I felt like that was the only way to prevent or delay the onset of diabetes type two, uh, which I, I felt was a genetic condition that ran in my family. Um, and Punjab, by the way, is uh, has the highest per capita incidence or prevalence of cardiovascular disease and diabetes type two in all of India and probably even in the world. Um, I, I got closer to diabetes actually because of the ketogenic disaster train that I was on. 2015 led to a series of diagnoses and I started searching and I found like Erin did, a documentary. My husband, Sean, and I, we decided to, you know, watch Forks Over Knives, and we followed that up with Cowspiracy, A Prayer for Compassion, which, uh, you know, you're a producer of uh, that documentary film, Victoria, and uh, Thomas Bay Jackson directed it, and, and we just had to change. We, we just said overnight, we're, we're going to go whole food plant-based. Uh, we did it. I was able to reverse a lot of these um, diagnoses uh, in under a year. And no sooner than that, I found myself um, at the doorstep virtually of the Main Street Vegan Academy and, and learned about veganism and overcame my initial hesitation and reluctance with the the V word. And now I'm very proudly a vegan activist. <laughs> oh, you're so wonderful. See everybody, aren't you in love with her too? It's very, very easy. And now, now that I've met your mom, Nevi, I know where some of this comes from. It's wonderful now that we're coming out of the pandemic, thank goodness that we get to get together with friends and families and families of friends, very special. So you two got together. Um, for very interesting reasons. Tell us how that came about. Sure, I can take that. Um, well, I'll tell you how Nivy and I met. So we met through a mutual friend who I, I think recognized um, that we have similar values and similar lifestyles. And this was back in 2020. And she told me she had this amazing nonprofit and the Divinity Coalition, which is an amazing group of plant-based 
uh, women leaders, and uh, we we joined forces on the 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 promotion the plan the to to Vice President Kamala Harris for to go plant based, and um, we we also then realized we were both members of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and we joined forces there and have done work together through the Health Equity Achieved Through Lifestyle Medicine Group, where we participate in projects aimed at really focusing on achieving health equity, and um, you know, all through the pandemic, we're we've been seeing how this how this disease or, you know, COVID-19 has really affected people and communities. And so how this project that we're talking about today came to be, I was listening to a podcast, uh, the PCRM's podcast, The Exam Room, and to Dr. Kim Williams, who most people know, of course, in the plant-based world, he's the head of cardiology at Rush University. And of course, I listen to him anytime I can, because he's so smart. And, um, Anyway, at the t- he said on that podcast, he's like, I don't know anybody that eats a vegan diet and has had severe COVID or died. I mean, this was, you know, I, I could have changed, but at the time he said that. And, and this really made me think, gosh, you know, why is no one looking at this? Why is nobody really looking at, you know, do people that eat differently or different dietary patterns, do, do they have different outcomes with COVID-19? Since then, there have been a couple of studies coming out showing that a plant predominant diet does, does you know, improve outcomes, but, you know, no, no studies kind of like what, what we're embarking on and what we're doing. Um, and so I reached out to Nivi who is brilliant and with her, um, amazing experience in the business world and in consumer research research, we, we thought that we kind of had a nice mix of skill sets and, uh, we joined forces. So that's, that's how we met. That's so cool. Now, Nivi, you have so many things going on. And and this is one of the things that just amazes me about you. I feel like I'm always running to keep up. So talk about a couple of the things that you have done under the the umbrella of the Versa Foundation, which I believe was the first thing that you incorporated and started with, and then the subsequent product projects leading up uh, to the Gaia project. Sure. Um, so Victoria, I started the Versa Foundation um, just as an idea, and and it was conceptualized almost, you know, at a marketing and a storytelling, um, you know, class that I took at Stanford um, at their Graduate School of Management, and. Um, and, and my professor, Professor Jennifer Ocker, who's amazing, she's an amazing storyteller. And, and she said, we're going to do a community project um, which is close to your heart and will help you grow as a social entrepreneur. And, and mind you, this was even before I went vegan or even understood you know, about the plant-based diet. And I picked a project which took me back to my roots, um, to Punjab and, and to rural Punjab. And, and I knew instantly that I wanted to work with my amazing mom, you know, who's an anthropologist and she's worked with um, rural Fulkari artisans in, in the state. And, and I started visiting back home more often and trying to understand um, their life as artisans and and thinking about maybe I should start, um, you know, a micro credit facilitation sort of a nonprofit or something to improve their economic situation. And in parallel to this was my own search for my health, because I had so many different, you know, diseases at this point in time, and I was dealing with them. And no sooner had I discovered whole food plant-based nutrition, I immediately knew that this nonprofit, which is um, which is subsequently, you know, incorporated in fall of 2018 in the Boston area, that the Versa Foundation had to do not just with the economic prosperity and otherwise, you know, other aspects of bettering these artisans' lives, that it definitely had to be through the route of Um, veganism, it had to be through the route of whole food plant based nutrition. Um, So up until 2020, we ran um, health camps, culinary demonstrations, um, you know, partnering with faith based organizations in in Punjab, um, and talking to these women artisans, we adopted nearly five different villages at the peak of our um, impact and interaction with them. We had over 485 artisan families that were impacted, um, you know, because of the work. And, And I had just around that time graduated from the Culinary Health Educational Fundamentals Program, 
from uh, Institute of Lifestyle Medicine and Harvard Medical School and Spalding Rehab Hospital. And uh, that really taught me the power of experientially changing people's behavior. And that when you invite people to cook together, to eat together, you have a better chance of getting through to them. In 2020, the pandemic hit and um, our field work, our volunteer work in Punjab was hugely impacted. And, 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 and it also overlapped with the election fervor in the United States, you know, which is home for me at this point in time. And that led to um, the creation of the Javinity um, platform. And there are three distinct types of work that we do under, under this platform. One is coalitioning, petitioning, and trying to impact um, public policy and reform. Um, and that is exactly where the Plant Powered Kamala campaign was uh, placed. Number two, uh, I, I do host a monthly podcast. It's called Connecting the Dots. So we create a lot of content around plant-based nutrition and lifestyle medicine. And the third is research. As Erin um, mentioned, I do have a consumer research background. I, I understand it, I, I dabble in it, you know, and, and she has a clinical and a scientific background. And uh, in 2020, we'd already started our first qualitative research program that was called Project Shakti. And it was single-mindedly focused on women of color and low-income women in the United States. And the insights that flowed from that, you know, ethnographic qualitative research program sort of merged with Erin's idea. And when she said, hey, we want to do this and let's do this quantitatively, I thought it was a marriage of um, the, the, you know, both the worlds of qualitative research as well as quantitative research. And it would afford the Divinity Research Program to really capture this historical window of time, um, you know, of the pandemic. It, it is historical. We don't know um, how and if people will ever feel like this, the way they've felt during the pandemic ever again. We hope they don't. You know, we hope that we switch to a plant-based world very soon. Uh, but when Erin approached me with this idea, um, I felt that that was the obvious and natural progression for the Divinity Research Program and we launched Project Gaia together. And Nivi, I know you were personally touched by COVID. Do you feel comfortable sharing a little bit about that? Absolutely, I, I do. Um, and, and it's one of the primary fuels that fuels my work at this point. And, um, and, and Victoria, actually you had been a huge support to me at that point in time. I remember I was a student um, at the Main Street Vegan Academy program. Uh, I was part of the MVLCE program at the time. And um, my father passed. And, and this was August uh, you know, 16th, 2020. And, and I was in throes of despair. And on top of a, a, a term that I've learned from you, Victoria, you, uh, you've often mentioned Vistopia the vegan dystopia that a lot of us feel. And it just amplified my vegan dystopia at that point in time. And, and it was all a heady mix of what was happening in my personal life, um, you know, intertwining with everything that I was learning at the Mean Street Vegan Academy, embracing veganism, um, the work in India with the Versa Foundation coming to a pause and then Erin approaching me with this amazing opportunity to work with her. And um, I guess that in a way it was, it's um, the continuation of both the universes and my father's blessings uh, that we're all able to, and I'm able to do this work for the movement. We have uh, seven minutes left in, in this segment. So can you just start with an introduction I can't even imagine the scope of the research. You're trying to find out if people who eat plant-based came down with COVID and if they did, how they did with it. So, so Dr. Aaron, where did you start to collect this information? Well, we had, uh, we've had, we've had a 
uh, we're working with a major research firm, and we've also had a number of, of partners in the plant-based world that have helped us tremendously, which is which is fantastic. And we were offered a grant to get the first phase of this research going, which is which is wonderful. But uh, really, our goal was to kind of add to this growing body of research surrounding this unprecedented COVID nineteen pandemic, and really how how food choices may or may not impact you know COVID nineteen prevalence and severity of disease. And those were our two real the questions we wanted answered. But then we realized there's actually so many more things we needed to, to think about and talk about and find out from the, the public and the population out there what they're thinking. Because, um, you know, we know, you know, we know some people have chronic diseases. So we needed to ask a little bit about that. We need to find out, gosh, what about long COVID? We're finding out all sorts of new things about long COVID. We wanted to certainly uh, touch on the aspect of mental health. And that's really, really huge for us. And, um, you know, and we, and we know that food, right? We know food is the strongest lever to optimize human health right? And, and, and environmental sustainability of this planet. I think Dr. Dr. David Katz always says, you know, no matter how many viable humans we have, we need a viable planet. There are no viable humans without a viable planet. And so, um, and, and we know that unhealthy diets pose a greater risk to morbidity and mortality than, than unsafe sex, alcohol, drug, tobacco use, all of those things. And with the pandemic, we know that communities of color were disproportionately affected by COVID-19. And so we needed to find out about, about those things. And so um, you know, and, and again, besides that, the pandemic also highlighted the data gaps regard with regards to people of color and especially women and women of color and, and a lack of sex disaggregated data. And so we really went after several questions. So it was a rather long survey. And um, so, and that's as far as we've gotten thus far is to really gather the data. And now we're starting to analyze it, but um, we're really hoping to gain a lot of um, insights from this research, you know, to, to hopefully prevent future pandemics. But if there are future pandemics, we hope to glean some insight into what people can do from a behavior standpoint, um, everything from protective behaviors to other non-pharmaceutical interventions, uh, you know, that, that we know that the vaccines are important, but we really wanted to look at things like the social determinants of health and like income and access to care and employment status and food insecurity and access to healthy food. So our survey kind of encompasses all of those things. And so um, now it's just a matter of getting into the data and looking at it. So I know that things haven't been tabulated yet and you can't share your actual findings, but just give us kind of a general, general idea of what these comorbidities are, were, and, and how a whole foods plant-based diet could change some of that for people during that pandemic and going forward. Well, I can, I can speak a little bit to that. Yeah, there's definitely some, some research that shows that those that eat, um, you know, the, the, some of the comorbidities we see, right, that we've seen this huge spike in things like type two diabetes, not over the pandemic, but just over time, right? Um, and obesity, and heart disease, and cancers, much of which is is preventable. And we know that 80% of, of healthcare costs goes towards treating chronic disease, again, the vast majority, of which is, is preventable. So um, those, those things we know can lead to things like more inflammation in the body. And so if you're already have an inflamed body and you have, you have, you have health, health, you know, issues add to that, uh, the, a, a virus such as, as COVID-19. And unfortunately we've seen that some of these populations that have had worse, worse, um, you know, these, some of these comorbidities that they, they tend to have worse outcomes and that data is out there. And that's been shown by, by who ended up hospitalized and who ended up dying too. Unfortunately, we have lost so many people to this, this terrible pandemic. And so, um, the, 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 that's kind of the, really the, the reason we wanted to, to look at this data and, and, and find these answers from the, from the population. And you have a lot of courage to do this because when I first heard that this was your plan, I thought you're going to have to overcome backlash because so many people have said things like, well, oh, if you just eat well, you don't need to wear a mask or wash your hands or get vaccinated. And you guys aren't saying that. Can you just tell us where you're coming from on all that? 
Erin, and then we'll start with Nivia. Oh, sure. Okay. No, absolutely. No, we are we are absolutely understand that the I, I you know I'm fully vaccinated. My family is. I we, we understand the importance of the vaccines. Understand. I work in a hospital. I mean, I work in, in a clinic setting, and I, and of course we're wearing masks. And I'm definitely <laughs> definitely um, the, those behaviors are in tr tremendously important. And the, the information that the CDC puts out is tremendously important. And so I'm always watching that myself and the, giving those recommendations. But um, a, a matter of, you know, it, it's, it, it's exciting to think about empowering ourselves, right? And I think people really want to know, gosh, besides those things, is there anything else I can do? You know what I mean? Is there anything I, else I can do? And not only, you know, from, from a, what I eat, maybe does exercise help? Does, does, do any other behaviors help me that maybe I can have some level of control? I think that that's really why, why we wanted to, to do this. And, and, and so it's not either, or it's both. And yeah. Oh, well, that's so good to hear. My husband and I actually had a COVID in January, Omicron, which is apparently less uh, virulent than earlier strains. And we were both vaccinated as well. And it wasn't bad at all. And my daughter was saying, it's because you're vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And some of my other friends were saying, it's because of the way you eat. And it's like, whatever it is, it wasn't bad. And for that, we can be grateful. So everybody, as we go into break, um, think of something you're grateful for. That's always a wonderful thing to do. And enjoy these messages from the good people at Unity Online Radio, the voice of an awakening world. And we will be back with more of the Main Street Vegan podcast and these two amazing women from Project Gaia. Um. Welcome back, everybody. And if you are new to the world of Main Street Vegan, please check out all that goes on there at MainStreetVegan.net. We have Main Street Vegan Academy, which uh, Nivi alluded to. This is where you can train as a certified vegan lifestyle coach and educator. We do have another course coming up in October, and that's via Zoom. So wherever you are in the world, uh, you can be part of that. We also have a weekly blog, information about the film, A Prayer for Compassion. And also you might want to check out something else that's taking some of my time and interest and love these days. And that is the Compassion Consortium. That's Compassion consortium.org. I think saying it the British way makes it easier for people to know how to spell it. Uh, CompassionConsortium.org. We are an interfaith, interspiritual, interspecies center for people who want to pay a little attention to their spiritual side in the company of others who also care about all beings and the planet. So we meet on the fourth Sunday of every month. 4 p.m. Eastern time, and would love to have you join us. Do check out the website. It's really beautiful. Lots of inspiration there. And I'm getting a lot of inspiration from this, uh, this conversation. You guys are absolutely amazing. We are talking about the Gaia Project, which is part of the Divinity Foundation and, and the amazing work of these two very energetic women. And speaking of women, your data, your, your process here, and the people that you've sought out for this work seem to be largely women. So why, how'd you do that? And what are you finding out, Nevi? Um, well, v Victoria, one of the big reasons, you know, why we felt that this had to be a women-centered, women-led initiative is because some of the early reports that started coming out, you know, during the, the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 already called this pandemic um, a precursor to uh, the pink recession. And, and what they uh, seem, you know, what they seem to be meaning with that by that word was that women and especially women of color were more likely to be impacted. And that did bear out, you know, as, as the truth. And, and I know that, you know, and maybe Erin can talk a little bit more to the nature of the infection and, and the virus and the fact that um, it did lead to higher mortality amongst men. But when we look at the number of women 
that were exposed to it. You know, from healthcare to home care to restaurants to grocery stores, women workers, low paid workers, and women of color, they're on the front lines of the COVID 19 pandemic. So we knew that as we started to gather our data, that it had to be diverse, it had to be equitable, it had to be inclusive, and it really needed to capture what was going on in the country at that point in time and be representative of those um, who were exposed to it the most, uh, not just physically, um, but also mentally. And uh, Dr. Aaron, what, what can you add to that? Yeah, well, I think, and I think the mental health impact that Nivi uh, brings up is is an important thing that we really wanted to look at, at the, in this um, research and how, you know, the data is really showing that women, from a mental health standpoint, women have far worse, fared worse than, than men, um, you know, for who knows, a variety of reasons, but really, we know that women are primarily the caretakers doing unpaid work, and then if they are working a, a regular job having to do that, as well as homeschool and all those other potential reasons. But um, in general, you know, when, when we think about women doing research, right, it, we know that women have a number of hidden hurdles. There's in research there, there's gender bias, as we know, for years and years and years, this is this is plentiful and well documented. Even when the pandemic started, not a whole lot of uh, even COVID-19 research was sex disaggregated, I mean, pulling out the different sexes and looking at is this affecting them differently. And, and now that's gotten better, but um, women are underrepresented in positions of power and influence and in research trials and in also in publishing research. And um, at a minimum, this, the process is, seems to be harder for women. And so this is one of the reasons I admire Nivi and, and her, the divinity research, because she's really committed to that intersectionality and making sure that we are looking um, at, at women. And, and we have a whole women-led team which is which is wonderful and um, you know, we know in the nonprofit world is not easy. And I'm sure Nivi can also speak to that, the systemic sexism and racism that really does pervade, you know, that sector as well. So I feel like getting our foot in the door has been a challenge at time. Um, you know, and Nivi and I have both developed a pretty thick skin uh, in this process. And we know that we'll get a lot of no's, but you know, if you get that one amazing yes, that's all you need. And and so I think we've learned a lot and we really have learned about the importance of, of having the right team in place throughout this process. We've identified gaps, for instance, we needed somebody with manuscript writing experience and we brought on Katrina Monti, who's amazing. We needed someone with expertise in communication and we brought on Krista Leoncavallo and, you know, we have medical experts and, and just a, a really nice diverse team that's helping to really strengthen us. And so, um, and I think it's really strengthened our resolve as well, so. And if we have time, oh, I'm sorry, if you have time for it, um, uh, Victoria, I would love to share with you an anecdote, you know, around the struggles that we've experienced as women, you know, trying to reach out um, to different quarters for partnership, for, you know, advisory and, and so on. And, and, you know, early in the project, uh, when we were just looking at the research design, the methodology, the approach, you know, seeking out mainstream partners, you know, who would want to come on the journey with us. I remember reaching out to a creative communications firm and, um, uh, you know, and, and they're global, they're huge. And, and they came back, they listened to us patiently, and they came back and they actually declined to work on this project with us, um, citing entanglements with the animal agriculture you know, world. And, and that just that one anecdote um, and that experience has actually repeated itself over and over uh, when it came to research firms we want to talk to, um, other advisors that we wanted to seek, and, and so on. And it's just been an eye opening uh, experience for us, you know, that if as women and add to it the layer of women who are plant based, women who are not who don't hesitate to call themselves vegan or vegan activists, that when we knock on some really powerful doors, should they open those doors to us, we would have infinite possibilities, but they just won't because of these entanglements. So, so that's a term I definitely wanted to bring up, you know, and, and want to share that story 
Um, Cause that's been a huge learning experience. I'm sure it has. Well, I look forward to the day not very long from now when all these big firms will say to the meat and dairy people, well, I'm sorry, I have entanglements with the vegans. So the time is coming, the time is coming. So what other struggles have you had? I mean, this is such a huge project. I think sometimes just anything we want to bring into being, even if it just looks like a small, you know, neighborhood kind of event, takes a lot of work. And you're talking about taking on some really massive research and then working hopefully in tandem with some really big organizations. So what have you run into in addition to entanglements? Well, um, you know, we we do have the problem of plenty, if I can call it that. Uh, we set out initially uh, with a goal of, um, you know, securing about 2000 people who would perhaps agree to respond to us, you know, a thousand who ate animals and a thousand who preferred to, um, you know, go the compassionate route and, and chose only plants. And and we did not anticipate the overwhelming enthusiastic response that our survey got during the field work that happened in October to November 2021. And, and we ended up with 20,000 respondents. And that is huge, which has meant, um, you know, incremental labor hours. It has meant, um, you know, on top of the initially discussed um, analysis that we may need to do more. Um, and, and also, since we're working with primarily a market research firm, we're also, while we have the benefit of their expertise, their experience, their reputation, you know, in, in the business of consumer research, we're also bringing on biostatisticians, you know, people who understand scientific analysis and, and scientific research. And, and that has been, you know, quite a challenge for us to um, secure funds. It, it continues to be a challenge, um, you know, writing grants. Um, we've been told by uh, some uh, philanthropic organizations that we reached out to that research is too upstream. It's not downstream enough for, you know, their um, money set aside for vegan activism that they would rather spend somewhere else than research. Um, so, so yes, you know, there, there have been a plethora, you know, of different hoops to cross and, and that has made this experience an adventure. Um, but some of the struggles uh, really emanate from lack of the right type of um, talent and, and also to be able to pay for some of that talent um, to be a part of our team and help us with this amazing data and make sense of this amazing data that we have at this point. And what's the goal? Once you've made sense of it, what are you going to do with it? Either one of you or jump in together. <laughs> Well, um, you know, I, I just let Erin talk a little bit about our publishing, scientific publishing ambitions, and, and then I can take on the consumer fronted campaign aspects of it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, once we have analyzed the data, we do hope that the insights from this Rita or the research, excuse me, can help in identifying, you know, behaviors, perceptions, the impact that the pandemic has had on uh, populations. We, we really hope that the research can impact those, the health and behaviors in the long term, you know, the problems of chronic disease and health disparities so that, that really all people have the opportunity to improve their health through their, through, through what they choose to perhaps to what they choose to eat. And um, in, in remembering all of this, we really want to make sure we're looking at this through a health equ equity lens, because we really want to make sure all people should have access to healthy, affordable food and, and care. And so um, we, you know, Nivi will talk a little bit about, you know, how we really want to improve the information that the public is hearing, right? Because we know that so much marketing is aimed at, aimed at not, not the healthiest, you know, in, in the healthiest ways. So Right. Thank you so much for that, Erin. Um, you know, as, as Erin mentioned, social determinants of health, one of the biggest um, challenges within the ambit of social determinants of health um, are really the media determinants of health. And consumer behavior change or, or the behaviors of the layperson out there are so much determined by what they see on television, what they get to see uh, and consume on social media platforms. And if all of those are and this is what I call fake news. I think animal agriculture linked news is fake news. You know, when the egg industry or the poultry industry or the dairy industry tries to convince us, and they have done a great job of it um, by talking about 
um, how healthy they are, how important they are for us and for our children. And, and when they actually enroll celebrities that have huge sway with the masses, um, people who are sports persons, you know, people who are musicians and so on, and they, and they enroll them uh, to participate in their advertising campaigns, you know, something that I've been guilty of in my corporate past as well, you know, within the processed food and beverage industry. Um, I, I feel that healthcare programming doesn't stand a chance because it's competing for consumer attention. And, and consumer attention is necessarily going to go where sophisticated, subliminally, psychologically subversive tools of consumer psychology are deployed in the form of advertising. Um, and which is why in addition to the ambition of publishing scientifically, one of our bigger dream goals is to be able to take our findings, take our data and convert them into a creative storytelling format to be able to visualize our data, to be able to turn it to film, who knows, and, and really talk about um, how we can improve health education, how we can enhance evidence-based interventions, but how can we also draw upon the modalities and the vehicles of mass media, narrative, and art, you know, to elevate um, the voice of the published word. Because otherwise, the voice of the published word um, is limited to elite audiences that have access to advanced education, and it doesn't ever make it to the street. We got to give public health programming some street cred. And, and as you know, you like to say, uh, Victoria, we have to get the word out on the main street because that's where America lives. Exactly. I want to step away from main street, though, for a minute based on something that you said and into some of those corporate boardrooms where most of us never go. Now, you've been on the program before. So uh, if y'all are becoming great uh, Nivy Jaswal friends, you can find that uh, archival uh, programming on your, your podcast app or at Unity Online Radio. We call that show from keto disaster to plant based powerhouse because she is. But when you were working in the processed food industry and you didn't know what you know now, just tell us how you saw things so we can understand how the people who are still there are seeing things. They're not evil, they're just off base. Right, thank you so much for asking me that question. I truly felt that I was um, on a social mission to bring health to communities around the world, and especially underprivileged, vulnerable communities. And, and that is because there is a lot of um, corporate purpose, brand purpose, a lot of internal public relations messaging that an employee in the processed food and beverage world is exposed to. And, and what happens is that even though in the end, profit um, trumps purpose, but because you, you talk about and you, you give the airtime to your employees and to your consumers, um, you, you give so, so much airtime to the idea of purpose that that's, sometimes that's all they can see. So I, I, I did feel that um, I was you know, fighting for the right cause. Um, I, I felt like you know, uh, the work that we were doing, um, you know, without necessarily naming employers and, and they're great organizations, um, but I felt that until unless chronic illness hits people personally, it, and they don't start necessarily thinking about why did it happen to them. And, and in the corporate boardroom, um, I guess that there is a lot of apathy because they're talking about purpose. They're analyzing consumer insights and trend spotting and opportunity spotting, and, and they're monetizing purpose. And when you look at purpose from the lens of monetization, you've already put a distance between, that, between yourself and that word. And, and that's where probably the distance lies. Um, but when you're beset with chronic illness or when a loved one has a chronic illness and you're trying to desperately seek answers to it, and when you realize that despite your privilege, which I did, I continue to do, and despite all of the exposure to this is the best food, you know, in the world, this is the best organic grain fed, um, 
you know, pasture raised, um, you know, Kobe prefecture imported A5 Miyazaki grade beef that you will only get at Fogo de Chao or some other awesome steakhouses and so on. When you're just so deluded um, in that and wrapped up in that power hierarchy that tends to surround the corporate ecosystem and, and the boardroom ecosystem, you're just very far removed from purpose, even though that's the vocabulary you seem to be speaking day in and day out. And, and I think that's the irony of it, you know? And um, so my message to people who are still walking around eyes wide shut inside or outside the boardrooms is to really talk, you know, think about what is the purpose? Have you co-opted the corporate purpose to become your own? And, and if so, if there is a gap, please think about what might be your purpose as an individual, um, which is, you know, decoupled from and, and separate from your corporate identity, your CXO or senior vice president, whatever title, um, or the car that you drive or the, the brand logo on your lanyard or your access card into the building. The minute you're able to strip away those layers of ego, you might be left with some raw material to work with. And, and that is my message um, for everyone. And, and I understand it's a lucrative life to leave, um, but you'll never find the gold at the end of the rainbow unless you go you know, hunting for it. And you have to really do it with your true heart. You're on mute, Victoria. I'm on mute, my goodness. That's because I have so many animals around here. I didn't want people to be disturbed by their antics, but I, I was saying it under mute circumstances that I love how you talk about life's purpose, that, that whole idea of Dharma, that we came here to do something and probably many things. And when we're in touch with that every day, then we're doing our work. I, and somebody else's good work is, is not good work for us. You know, we have to know what we're supposed to do and you are certainly doing yours, both of you. So as we come to an end here, I could talk to you guys for a really long time. Let us know where you are right now, what stage are you in with, with the Gaia project, and what do you need? What can we do? What can people we know do? Help us help you. Well, I'll, I'll take this, I guess, as well. But, um, well, I mean, I think we know how important research is, right? And, and, and you know, but that all research sciences really do rely on external funding, unfortunately, in a perfect world, we wouldn't, money wouldn't matter. And all scientific studies would be able to be completed without it. Right. But unfortunately, this is not the case. <laughs> so, um, you know, we are in the data analysis phase and that is um, where we are hoping to uncover, you know, the impact this pandemic has had on the population um, from our, from our survey. And, um, you know, you know, and hopefully we'll find if there are differences and hopefully things people can do. Um, but, but donating to the Versa Foundation is an amazing place to start helping us. You know, that's what we need right now is funding. And, and we are, um, we have a great team of people and volunteers that are working with us to make this happen. So um, that's, that's what I would say we need more than anything right at the moment. And uh, towards that end, we've actually put together a three minute short video, which has the entire team. Um, and we've crunched the entire story of why each of us have gotten together and why we're doing Project Gaia. Um, it, it's been you know, made by uh, another brilliant person on our team. Her name is Priyanka Natani. She helps us with social media and communications. And, and she's just made this awesome scratch film in-house um, and, and that's on our uh, website. It's also on our social media platforms um, and it's also on a GoFundMe page that we recently started um, looking for any kind of funds, any resources, any help that people who are listening to this or watching this might be able to, you know, give to Project I and we'll be very grateful for your support. So the basic website is the Versa, V-I-R-S-A, foundation.org. 
And if you want to do slash project Gaia, project hyphen Gaia, um, you can go right to the page and we will put all of that. And in fact, all of the social media information, et cetera, uh, for this amazing project, Project Gaia. You can also find uh, their work on Instagram and Facebook at Givinity. J-I-V-I-N-I-T-I. -I -I. Now help us out, Nivi, with what that means. I know a jiva is our soul coming to earth. So tell us about divinity. Right. Um, so Victoria, it's a made up word, um, but it's a composite word that's, uh, you know, that uses two beautiful Sanskrit terms, um, as you alluded to the first one, which is jiva or jeev, which is life. Um, wholesomeness, a sense of being alive. And niti, N-I-T-I, is the word for the path, the methodology. So divinity, when you put it together, um, it, it's actually just a made up word. It does not exist in Sanskrit, you know, uh, um, in and of itself. Um, but it's really the path towards being alive. And that's almost like a summation of everything that we stand for and what the mandate for our plant powered efforts is. That is so beautiful. You are the only person I know who makes up words in Sanskrit. How <laughs> cool is that? So just in our last minute, ladies, uh, each of you just uh, give us a final word, Dr. Aaron. Yeah, well, I just want to say thank you, Victoria, for having us um, and giving us the opportunity to, to share the work we're doing and um, for all you do for to help to help people change their lives and their health for the better. That is so kind. Once I think you kind of get bitten by this bug, it's like, oh, my gosh, there's a way to eat that helps others and, and helps the innocent and helps the animals and helps feed people and saves the planet. And oh my gosh, it clears out your arteries and helps yep. you feel longer and feel better. <laughs> it's like, what's not to like? And so I think it kind of lights a fire under us. And speaking of people with fires under them, Nivi have the last word. Well, thank you so much, Victoria. I just wanted to express my gratitude um, for having both of us here on your program. Um, we understand that, you know, right now with the ongoing pandemic, with, uh, you know, whatever is happening, the war in Eastern Europe, um, I just wanted to um, say that Javinity, the Versa Foundation and Project Gaia stands with the people of Ukraine and we stand equally with the people of Russia because we know that none of us wants war, we want peace, we want harmony to prevail in the world. And, uh, and, and I do dabble a little bit in Russian, so I will just say, Niet Vainie. Oh, Nivi, you're just the best. Thank you so much. I'm just so tickled that we have had this fabulous trio time together today. And I just can't thank you enough for both who you are and all that you do in the world. So thanks also to Unity Online Radio for making this happen and to everybody who listened. God bless you. Eat your veggies.